Hello everyone and welcome to the Arctic Bookshop Isolation Talk number four. Tonight we have ARM uh, from Melbourne who are coming to speak to us. Uh, but before we kick up on that, I just thought I'd um, have a bit of a chat about what we were trying to do with the Isolation Talks, um, what was happening and what's going on in our lives. Um, so first of all, I think the, the Isolation Talks are really a, an opportunity to bring everyone together, bring them to one, to, you all to one place at one time, uh, I've had lots of inquiries about whether the, the talks are available online at a later date and at the moment they're not because we're trying to create an environment similar to the idea that you would come to a lecture, all be in the same room at the same time, all hear the same information and kind of engage in a discussion um, across what at the moment is pretty challenging times. Um, again, I want to apologise if the sound has been poor in the past. Uh, I'm slowly working my head through that um, and I think tonight we might have it but I won't promise anything. It does take a little bit of time for your comments to come through so if, um, if I don't respond straight away please just give me a moment. Um, we also wanted to thank you from the bookshop for buying books. We've had an amazing response to um, the bookshop since we've been closed physically. Um, just remember we are there if you feel like buying a present for a friend. Nothing better than architecture books. <laughs> we also, uh, obviously tonight, have uh, cop copies of Mongrel Rapture, which is ARM's book, which I know that the guys will be talking about later this evening. We have those in the, in the book there, $85. And um, importantly, uh, it's a publication about Australian architecture practice, but it's also a publication made by an Australian publisher and distributed by Australian distributors and sold in Australian bookshops. So it's kind of... Uh, tripartite of excellence, we think, for that. Um, so tonight we have um, ARM. Um, we have um, Mark, Andrew and Andrew. You can all wave, guys, so you know which one, Mark, Andrew and Andrew, <laughs> across Melbourne and Sydney. Um, so thanks for, thank you, everyone, the three of you for coming. Really appreciate you making some time to be here. Thanks, um, thanks, sir. Yeah, no, really, really great. I think one of the things uh, we've been trying to do with the with the talks is to get people that we know and people we don't know that well. And um, I kn I've met Mark a couple of times at actually project interviews, but that's a, that's about as close as we've ever got. <laughs> um, but I thought it'd be quite good to get um, ARM to come and have a chat to us all. Um, ARM uh, it really became known to me. Uh, in the early 90s when, when I was at university and they were really the uh, infant prodigy of the Melbourne architecture scene and they had kind of, I think the story I remember the most was that they were um, completing Story Hall in Melbourne and the planning minister at the time uh, had begged the, the AR, uh, sorry, uh, RMIT to maintain the hoarding up on the, t on the building until the building was actually complete um, because he was too scared about what the community would say about Story Hall and what ARM were doing to Story Hall, um, which I think is a really fantastic story. It's a remarkable building, I think one of, um, one of Melbourne's best uh, in terms of the way in which the... Uh, the way in which the, the architecture has kind of engaged with culture and society and the institution that is RMIT. I might just get you guys to transition across to your um, presentation, if you could, that would be excellent. Um, but also I think the other thing with ARM is that they have been incredibly voracious in the quantity of work they've been doing nationally. Um, the Australian Museum in Canberra, Melbourne Theatre Company and South Bank, um, I think famously the Shrine of Remembrance, um, uh, one of the other buildings that uh, enjoy the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies at the Australian Museum, which is famously a black version of um, Villa Savoy. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. Um, there's a lot for the team to present to you today. I think they're going to talk about three projects in particular, um, a book and two buildings. I think that's right, isn't that, Mark? Book and two buildings. Um, so we might hand over to you guys. So I'll get you to share your um, your presentation and then we'll, Mark, if you want to share your screen with us. It should be sharing now. Can you no, it? it's not. So if we can just continue to tick that again. Let me try that again. How's that? 
No, not still not working. Oh gosh, been sitting there sharing. <laughs> Maybe unshare and share. See how you go. Of course, it worked perfectly in rehearsal. Yeah, about always. five about five minutes ago, it worked fantastically, <laughs> which is always the way. Is it working now? No, it's not. Um, I think it might have something to do. Um, maybe one of the Andrews, could you? Do you have the presentation that you could share and see if it works from your computer? Or is it only on Mark's? It would make it even more yeah. more exciting. It's on our network. Oh, there we go. See, we can give it a whirl. See what see what happens. It is going okay. Well, let's see how we go. Let's see if there's a lag as it, as it goes. Um, thanks, Adam, and, and um, thanks to Architects Bookshop for having us. Um, I mean, it is actually really nice to be here um, in such a strange time, and um, where it's this is actually a really great thing that you're doing. And I think the fact that it's all kind of live and you're all in here together, I think, is a kind of especially. Um, Kind of insightful um, um, model. Um, the we will talk about a book and three buildings. Um, the Sydney College of the Arts, which is um, almost finished. Um, the uh, Blacktown International Centre uh, of Training Excellence, and um, which is just coming out of concept design, and uh, the the Sydney Opera House, uh, which is ostensibly our first job in Sydney, um, which is a little bit scary because it was Luxembourg's first job as well and uh, it kind of all ended in tears. Um, but uh, I'm first going to launch off the, uh, by talking about a, a book. Um, now, Mark, sorry, just briefly, we can't, I can't see the presentation. I don't know if you can, Andrew. No, and I can't either. Oh, what are we doing here? It says it's sharing from my end. So now we're into amateur hour. Mark, maybe just try and unshare. Um, yeah, it's unsharing. Just tried sharing it in a different way. Is that now working? Yeah. And actually, no one's been out else been absolutely. We're just going to get Mark to jump out of the meeting and jump back into it because I think sometimes with Microsoft Teams. It doesn't allow, once it's not working, it's quite hard to make it work. So, Mark, are you still there? You've got to love live TV, don't you? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've lost Mark completely. He's kind of frozen on the screen. This could be an ARM building. Mark frozen on the on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> He's usually more animated than that. Yeah. He is usually more animated than that. Um, what we might do is I might hang up on the three of you. We might get back into this screen again. I'll just transition across the slide for everybody while we're trying to sort this out. So sorry Thanks. about this to everybody. Okay. Um, no let me just give that a bit of a go. I'm just going to hang up on you all and we'll just see how this goes. Sure. Just sorry to everyone watching. I'm going to give this a bit of a try again. Mark, are you there? I'm here. Right, we've got you. How about you try sharing your screen? 
Is it taking a long time to connect? Because I was connected for quite a while before. Uh, no, you had um, frozen, so I decided we'd close the whole thing and we'll start again. Oh, now we've got the screen. So great. Let's. Uh, we can start with you, and the boys will come in. I'm assuming as we go along. All right. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. Hopefully, we hopefully it'll be smooth sailing from here on in. Um, the title of the talk is strangely fiction, um, and that's because it's really about the idea that while architecture has a, a kind of responsibility to shelter, um, it also has this other responsibility to capture the kind of spirit or um, narratives of our time. Um, Robert Hughes said that architecture is the art you live in, and without it. Uh, life is nasty, brutish, and wet, or something like that. And I suppose each of these um, projects and the book uh, kind of capture that idea of, well, that the, maybe the narratives or the truth is, is stranger than the fiction. Um, so this is um, this is Mungal Rapture. Um, it's, you'll have noticed that it's not architecture, it's not even a building, um, but it's about 30 years of um, ARM's practice. Uh, while I, I was the, one of the co-editors, um, uh, even it took us about three and a half years um, to do, so it had the sort of lifespan of a project. Um, I'm gonna talk about the, the kind of concept of the book and then it's, it's making, I suppose. There are, of course, you know, something like this is, is, is always a, the product of a kind of group of people, um, a, a group of authors. And in this case, it has uh, 16 authors um, and 1,616 pages. Um, that was a complete coincidence, um, but it presented a really um, difficult kind of technical problem with how to, how to manage a book of that scale. And, and that's the second part of the, um, the talk. Uh, so really this is the kind of, uh, some of the kind of group who, who helped put this together, not including uh, the um, eight authors from within the practice. We also had people like Harriet Edquist, Richard Monday, uh, Grant Morani, uh, people like Vivian Mitsubyani, Grant Heyman, uh, John MacArthur, Mark C. Taylor, Leon Van Scheich, Charles Jenks, and Naomi Stetson. There were people kind of all over the country and from around the world as well, um, and in different parts of the discipline as well, with different interests. Um, our publisher, Andrew McKenzie, there, uh, is there also, and um, uh, my co-editor, Matt Ward, as well. Um, and, of course, the um, inimitable Stuart Geddes, who designed all those 1,616 unique um, pages. God bless him. Um, the, I guess everyone who was involved with the production of the book is, were kind of bibliophiles and, and um, kind of obsessed with the, the, the design of books, um, their technology, um, and, and maybe also thought that we could, we could think about the concept of the book and draw from its history and technology in informing how we went about editing, designing, and producing this book ourselves. Um, in this case, the illuminated manuscript with a kind of great combination of words and image. Um, and the two not, not really separate, actually, that maybe the words are an image and the images um, um, create words as well or associations or meanings as well. So they have the kind of power of words too, so that each page is a, compo is a composition in itself, decorative and, and communic communicative, so that design design itself um, is the content. Um, this happens to be a Bible, um, and obviously it was kind of um, incredibly important in the kind of development um, and technology, the development of the technology of the book and it's kind of um, uh, popularizing throughout the world. Um, but here, particularly the um, weight of the paper, um, some of the kind of tropes of books like the ribbon um, and its its uh, gilding. Um, you'll notice there that the book lies totally flat on its surface, um, which if you try that with a few of your books at home, is actually quite an unusual thing. And it's quite a difficult thing to achieve. And it has to do with um, particular types of binding and in these days, particular types of glue. Um, beyond that, we were also interested in its structure. 
So the, the, the Bible is a kind of, is many books bound together to form one artefact, which um, is in itself um, quite interesting. That it points, by in doing so, it points to a, a kind of broader culture being brought together in this one thing. Um, our book is not a Bible um, and is quite a different sort of book. Um, this is almost the first page in the book, and it has a it has an argument to make. Uh, fuck local, buy global. It it seemed appropriate then, and and perhaps it seems even more appropriate now. Um, a reversal of, of of all the things that we really believe, which is which is maybe fuck global and buy local. Um, this, we're, we're sort of working our way into the book, I guess, slowly, but this here is on the spine. This book is about that moment when there is no going back. Um, forgive me, but I'm going to read a little bit from the book. Um, and this is from the introduction. Uh, we start with a quote from Rem Coolhouse. Architecture is like a lead ball chained to a prisoner's leg. To escape, he has to get rid of its weight, but all he can do is scrape slivers off with a teaspoon. That's such a nihilistic view of architecture. But of course, um, the, the prisoner has other options. Uh, option one, he could sharpen the spoon and cut his leg off, or he could use the weight of the lead ball and um, smash his own leg and thereby get his leg out from, from the, the ball and chain. And I suppose this was our kind of thinking about this, that thinking through Rem Koolhaas's um, proposition, and our introduction kind of continues. The prisoner will remember that moment when he decided what to do, when it dawned on him, when he could finally see it like a vision, like an epiphany of sorts, and then getting on with it, getting down to it, as quickly as possible with that heavy ball, that first incredible thump on his foot. And then again and again, bashing at that foot, eyes shut, everything black, knowing that now there was no way back, no way to stop now, no way of examining the consequences, the pros and cons, the niceties of various options, various possibilities instead of this. This book is about that feeling, that mongrel rapture, that moment of not wanting to look, not wanting to believe it was the only way, not wanting to explain that it was self-inflicted, that it was inescapable. This book is about that moment when there is no going back. The proposition really is that design is like that, architecture is like that, and practice is like that. that if we if we accept that um, the responsibility of architecture is to is to shelter and to communicate, then at some point you you have to decide. You you have to um, find that option and then act. Um, and that that's um, a great epiphany when you find that moment, but it is also um, uh, filled with terror. Um, and, and maybe that's a particularly visceral description of that that moment. So then the problem is, well, how do you how do you capture thirty years of practice and kind of put it into a put it into a book, um, something as static as a book, and something as kind of final as a book, uh, or finite as a book? And we came up really this idea of the kind of visible and invisible spectrum that. Uh, with the complete colours of the rainbow, we really only see a very narrow band of um, of the of the possible spectrum, um, with ultraviolet and infrared beyond our our natural perception without you know the special equipment, and that maybe our work exists within this or our book exists within this visible spectrum, and there's kind of maybe much more and much more of interest beyond this this visible spectrum. So we took that, that rainbow and um, added, added our own themes, which perhaps seem somewhat abstract, fringe, exegesis, drawings, critical artifacts, 
buildings we can't draw, puzzling and negative affirmation. But they each represent really particular interests or, or concerns of the practice over that time frame from the fringe, the idea of the kind of the local or and exegesis, this, uh, this idea of finding meaning in architecture, um, drawings, kind of self-explanatory, um, critical artifacts. Uh, oh, I might come back to help some of these, but puzzling also this idea of kind of questioning and negative affirmation and kind of particular philosophical, but also um, design techniques. Um, the book, in fact, is about, um, so much of the book is about this idea of, of questioning. Um, this this uh, slide has uh, Dorothy Dix on one page on at the top there and Jacques Derrida inverted below. Um, both are known for their own kind of questioning. And I suggest that they've probably never been on the same page uh, on anything. Um, Derrida said, I think all genuine questioning is summoned by a certain type of eschatology. Eschatology is the study or knowledge of the end times, the apocalypse. Um, and Mungo Rapture is a book of questioning. Um, and in some ways, that's, that makes it deeply unsatisfying. It doesn't give any easily recycled methods, any real answers, or purport to solve any real problems. And so in some ways, it feels like, like too much, you know, at this, at, with that much weight, with that much material, surely, you know, that should have been enough to get at, a, at an answer. Surely that was enough to capture the history or the kind of the elevator pitch or the kind of driving um, data of a project. Um, but somehow, because of that questioning attitude, it still doesn't feel like enough. It kind of ends up feeling like, a, like an answer on the tip of your tongue. So in the end, we really just sort of tried to work through these chapters in a sort of in a methodical way, but also in a sort of self-critical way and in a way that, that opened, op kept us open to criticism, to being criticised or to, um, and, and we saw that as a sort of, how could we, how could we um, be um, generous in opening out, opening the work up um, and, and letting people um, um, pull it apart. So ARM really historically very rarely published drawings. Um, so in the book, we, we selected seven key projects and published a kind of edited set of drawings. Um, but you're, with each project, there's a little QR code and that QR code takes you to um, a, a full set of drawings. Um, so in the case of, well, this is the National Museum of Australia, but um, and so you get a full documentation set, but in the case of um, Story Hall, which is the project that, that Adam mentioned at the outset, you have a um, the full and original tender set um, with a complete with all its hand-drawn details. And it's a, it's a fabulous um, document. And the idea is that this then, it says, here we are, that through our drawings, through this language that we all share, um, by sharing those drawings, we say, well, here we are, come, come see, um, come talk with us. Um, and there are, there are heaps of these kinds of links throughout the whole project, which, throughout the whole book, which means that there are actually many more hundreds of pages um, and other media that, that kind of hangs around the physical book, like a kind of cloud. So it's that, it's that idea of the book is the visible spectrum and then beyond that, is a whole spectrum that we that we can't see or we can't access except through a kind of special um, um, equipment. Um, we also do try to be uh, didactic and to retell the stories of the work. Um, in this case, um, uh, the some of the forty nine meanings of Story Hall um, and. I guess through telling the stories of its making and its and its designing, we somehow reveal some um, deeper truth about the project. Um, so too, in a chapter dedicated to um, buildings we can't draw, 
Um, and this chapter is a kind of exegesis of um, the practice's long-term interest in generative and um, emergent design. Uh, I think you're seeing here a drawing um, created through an AutoCAD LISP routine um, that reflects uh, Philip Johnson's glass house in a conical mirror, creating a, a wholly new um, project, um, entirely without the kind of designer's hand, or at least that's the kind of conceit. Um, and and I think through this, there's the there's this idea that a generative process is a kind of a critical process, um, an evolving process, rather than a kind of acceptance that architecture is only the purview of the of the genius artist, and that architecture's only genesis is in the kind of miraculous um, sketch. Um, that rather you end up with images uh, like this that require some kind of inter interpretation or imagination or insight uh, to make some architecture from it. Um, or maybe maybe you just have to squint. Um, we collect also um, a, a whole series of what we called critical artifacts in that they are of critical importance to the practice. They're like kind of talismans or family photos or um, you know, your childhood soft toy, um, but that they also, by being critical of culture, they also suggest some future or, or offer some proposition. Um, in this case, it's a letter from a, pen, from a, a prisoner in Pentridge, um, written to Ian McDougall, uh, asking Ian to send him some old copies of Transition magazine, which he was the um, editor and, and founder of. And there's such this, this uh, incredible poignancy where the, um, the letter writer says, I have no one on the outside who can buy one for me. And there's this sort of um, desire uh, for knowledge. Um, they're, at the time, they're training to be a... a an architectural draftsman, which suggests that, that someone had said, perhaps you should read this, which is, um, I wish I knew more of the story. Um, the book, of course, also um, has uh, some extraordinary photos um, taken by John Gollings, um, Peter Bennett, Trevor Main, and, and others. Um, we're fortunate in this country really to have some really fabulous architectural photographers, and they, they seem to just outdo themselves over and again, and it seemed unfortunate to kind of lump their work, you know, through the book, kind of unceremoniously, as if as if the photographer's work was only an illustration of our work. Um, and so we gave the, the photographers their own section, um, so that the work of the photographer could kind of stand alone. Um, and 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 so I, I suppose rather than the photographs being illustrative, they they are given room to have their own, to display their own artistry, I suppose, and their own craft. Um, and I think here they really do start to feel like a, a, an illustrated manuscript. Um, the book, I suppose, also, all of these things, I suppose, build up to this idea that the, the journey through the book or in reading the book, there's a, a, a kind of discovery um, and that, that's a kind of personal process uh, and maybe even a visceral one. Now, this is, a, um, this is the chapter called Negative Affirmation um, and it's as if um, the book has been kind of damaged um, by a previous owner or, or maybe by the content it, itself. Um, we're not really sure as we travel through. Um, ultimately, you do find the source. Um, uh, it's a uh, it's in an article called um, Boolean Circumcision. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to you to have a closer look at that particular spread. Um, it's it's sort of as as if it's it's impossible to stem the bleeding in the book. Um, so 
Mongrel Rapture is a kind of really visceral book in that sense. Like working through it, we we kind of in the introduction we kind of implore people to read it out loud as if as if rather than on the train, um, you, you it's a kind of ritual, and that the words the words have a kind of rhythm and roll through. So a physical experience in the same way that that a building is a physical experience, um, and you know. I think actually the work itself, maybe we all find this, that that, that our buildings uh, take on a life of their own. Uh, once we've finished drawing them and they we put them out in the out in the rain, they have their own visceral quality that that perhaps we we hadn't fully imagined. Um, but despite all that, it's also you know kind of a, a kind of serious book um, in that. It has all the, the components of what we might expect of of, a, of any a, any history or any um, didactic book. So in this case, a, a timeline and a catalogue of the work um, and a glossary too, and also a, a, a an index. Every serious book has an index. Um, ours is not very serious. Um, here uh, we have things like as if or forget and not and hope and the list of where all those things are. All right, I'm gonna move through this final section, the, the creation of the book quite quickly. We wanted to print it in Australia. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't possible. Technically, it wasn't possible. We couldn't find a printer who was able to do it. So we ended up going to Amity Printing um, and, and Stuart found these guys. Um, it turned out that the Amity Foundation is um, the largest philanthropic organization in China. Um, and does a huge amount of philanthropic work. Uh, and the, the printing press is the kind of commercial arm of, of the foundation and, and it's a not-for-profit organisation. So we felt like maybe we had um, salved our souls a little bit in having to go overseas. This is Stuart. He went to China, accompanied the book to China uh, to have it printed. Um, I think this is him doing being a Chinese tourist. Um, this is the, the, the factory, the printers. Um, and we've got, these are all Stuart's photos from, when, from his time there. Um, there's a lot of photos of this kind of stuff, checking the photo, checking that the colors are right, that the, that the paper is kind of giving the right quality and, and texture, uh, that the kind of registration and color separation is working. Uh, this is the kind of process of, of getting ready to print. And of course, then you get into the printer and um, this happens. Uh, the, the print jammed over and over and over again. And after three and a half years, um, it was disheartening, I think, for everyone to hear that, that we had such a catastrophic problem. The, the, and I remember Stuart calling us in a, you know, he sounded pretty desperate. But the printer called the paper manufacturer, who's down the road, and said, we have a problem with the paper. It's jamming. We need to, to change the specifications of the paper. So the paper manufacturer um, manufactured a bespoke paper for the book and had it back on the press within 48 hours, um, which still strikes me as extraordinary. Um, here we have it beginning to be bound together. You can see those kind of rainbow chapters there on the side. Um, the one thumb index that takes you to the chapter of, of the usual suspects, our friends uh, who were kind enough to write for us. Uh, and this man is cutting that thumb index. Um, and then, the invisible spectrum being gilded onto the outside to hide uh, the light uh, within. Um, we do give one little hint of that with this fabulous um, rainbow um, gilding uh, that is debossed into the surface. There's the rainbow machine debossing the, the, um, the covers. A few test runs of that cover itself. Uh, a document that is bound, uh, gilded, um, it's ribbon attached and ready for binding. Um, each copy is hand bound, um, which is this kind of 
a great harking back, I suppose, to this this craft of, of bookmaking. Um, even down to this sort of each book is is pressed in this wooden press. And the final product itself. I love this 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 picture because there's a kind of uh, weary uh, pride or affirmation um, uh, of the product. Um, so the next project we're going to talk about is a, um, a quite a small project um, at the University of Sydney. Uh, it's the, the Sydney College of the Arts. Some of you will know that um, the, the college is currently housed uh, at Callum Park um, over in Roselle. Um, uh, and is being relocated to the main campus into a single building. Um, and those of you who know the SCA, the current SCA campus, it's a huge sprawling Kirkbride ride um, uh, former hospital. Uh, and they're now being condensed into this, in, into this one building. I'm just going to talk about a small aspect of the project, which is just the facade um, that's still under construction. But um, it's it, th that building is the old teachers college, um, which was designed by George McRae, which some of you will know as uh, the government architect. He designed uh, the Queen Victoria building, the Department of Education, uh, that great elephant house, which is still there at Taronga Zoo, the, the lower entrance of the Taronga Zoo, Parcels Post Office um, over near UTS, and the tram depot in Roselle. Uh, so kind of quite a, 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 an inventive um, and interesting architect. Um, and this building, which you might notice from the dates, was interrupted by the war um, and was intended to be a much more ornate building. But um, after the war, there was few materials and not a lot of money. And so it got quite stripped back. It's quite a kind of um, uh, Protestant building in, in that sense. Um, so this is our, our site, I suppose. Uh, the the program itself is um, kind of the antithesis of the of the building. Um, you know that each program tends to disrupt the other, uh, and and the most significant of that program requires fairly significant mechanical um, intervention um, in the existing building. And so we went through this quite detailed exercise of mapping the various programs and how they might relate or or avoid one another from I suppose, noisy to quiet work and dirty to clean, and then mapping that into a series of um, desired uh, relationships um, and then uh, throughout the building. I won't talk too much about this, but really this um, is mirrored, is a mirror of, the, um, of that mapping process. So to the design itself, our, our design process is really, and maybe this is true of, of all of us, is very messy um, and it begins uh, with a kind of chaos um, uh, and the unknown and you and you hope that it uh, it smooths out over time um, as we know more it's almost like you are 95% wrong at the beginning and you hope that you're only 5% wrong at the end um, and that that flat line is not is not your your death um, so I guess this, this presentation kind of maps some of that chaos. Um, the bit of the building that I'm going to talk about is the glassworks. And it, it is the, um, uh, I guess it's the kind of most intensive part of the building uh, in terms of mechanical material, but also the most aggressive in how it's attached to the building. And we, so we started looking at things like reticello glass, which is this extraordinary kind of physical process of creating this very, um, intricate glass. There's a, you can possibly just see in that image, there's a tiny air bubble in the middle of each one of those grids. And uh, if that air, that air bubble is blown into the, um, the glass through the process, and if it's too close to the surface, the whole thing explodes. So it's this great kind of physic, virtuosic physical skill. Um, and that seemed to be a great high bar for what we hope to achieve. Um, so how do you add to a, a um, uh, an arts and crafts building. Um, the 19th century is a great, um, uh, a great kind of uh, resource for that. And here, the glass house of the 19th century, 
we're here interested much more in the filigree of that, that um, ironwork than in the glass itself. Um, and then other kinds of glass houses. Um, Philip Johnson's uh, that he, he always said was, was inspired by the burning ruins of Europe. Um, Apple's, um, the Apple store in New York City, what are, are also a kind of miraculous glass cube. Um, and we were interested in this sort of relationship between art and architecture, um, which is sort of felt summed up by this image, a kind of, you know, fairly awkward relationship, you'd have to say, contemporary architecture and, and art. Maybe we're, we're kind of unsure of each other. Um, an equally uh, unsettling image, I think, um, maybe the, the kind of creepy draftsman there on the right and the fairly uncomfortable looking recumbent woman on the left. What we're interested really in here is the, the screen in the middle, that that might be architecture, that that might, architecture might be the armature for seeing the world uh, and a way to um, transpose what we see into a new design. Um, and through that, we were interested then, I guess, in the figure as the figure being a, a kind of turning point between art and architecture. Here, um, a petroglyph in, in Woi Woi. Um, when you start looking, you find them everywhere. Um, this is a, a tomb painting in Egypt. Um, Arthur Boyd's Sleeping Bride uh, from the late 50s. Um, Mao Tse Tung lying in state in 1976. Um, and Andy Warhol's interminable film Sleep from 1963. Um, each of these a, a kind of figure in time. Um, but of course, as we're also interested in this sort of the figure in, in space. And, and here, Marais running a lion tamer captured in space and time through his incredible photographic process. So we wondered how we might find an architectural equivalent of that. And, the Moiré screen seemed like a good opportunity with it sort of shuffling past it. You know, it, it's dependent on the moving figure. Um, and we have um, Carsten Nikolai really to, to thank his fabulous book, The Moiré Index, which documents these slight shifts of different kinds of Moiré, Moiré processes. Um, and particularly here, kind of curved Moirés. Um, so we began with this kind of proposable figure um, let's see if this animation works. Hopefully you see there that the figure within appears and um, disappears. Um, and so that in some ways the design is kind of weak um, in that it, it, it's like a mirage or a cloud. It, it kind of vanishes just as you approach it. Um, and at other times it's quite, um, quite visible. Um, quite um, stark. Um, this picture um, by Leslie Dumbrell kind of is the thing that gave us a bit of a hint um, as to how to think about this screen as something that's not just an image, not just flat, but that, that an image has a kind of architecture of its own. And here it's this sense that there are figures and objects shifting past each other um, in space, um, that it, that, um, that, that the image, I suppose, could be interrogated itself. And so here, the, the CMYK image, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, none of which themselves give us a kind of clear picture of the world, only through the kind of combination of these layers could you find um, this image as a sort of interrogation of that legibility. Uh, and here, the, the figure that ultimately ended, on the, ended up on the building, a, a kind of androgynous figure that we um, modeled, sculpted, um, uh, in actually a quite a long discussion with the, the college itself. And um, then its constituent parts, the yellow, the magenta, the yellow and mag magenta together, hopefully there you can start to see that kind of volume coming up, the figure coming up, the cyan and the figure itself, um, a kind of mirage that in elevation, it disappears. So in that sense, it's a it's a, an architecture you can't draw because the the sort of traditional drawings, you know, within our discipline, fail to capture its its architecture. It defies that. Of course, you've got to make the mirage. Here, each each fin is cut 
um, um, individually, painted, painted again and layered, and then these kind of, and then interlaced, I suppose, to create that kind of moiré effect and to, and to affect its, its legibility. Um, and here are a few moments from that where the image is obviously illegible um, as you get closer. On the back, uh, the black is provided by a, um, a perforated screen, which mimics the kind of um, CMYK halftone printing that we all know from newspapers and magazines. Um, again, I guess pointing uh, to that idea of the image. Uh, and still under construction, but a good amount of that facade uh, in place with that figure just emerging from this angle and disappearing um, again, that kind of um, uh, vivid and then weak architecture. Um, I'm going to pass over uh, to uh, Andrew Lillerman now. He's going to talk about uh, Blacktown. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Um, um, I've actually got a bit of an echo. Of echo. Um, I can that? hear myself. But yeah, that's better. Um, so, uh, following on from uh, the SCA project, the International Centre for Training Excellence, which is out in Blacktown. Um, hopefully, this is going to scroll through. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Blacktown, which is west of Sydney Centre, about a 45 minute drive. Um, and then our site uh, is located at the Blacktown International Sports Park, which is a, a legacy precinct uh, from the Sydney Olympic Games um, that the uh, Blacktown Council have inherited and are looking at ways to sort of reinvigorate it, reanimate it and bring people into that park. That park... Um, has various different codes in it, um, different uh, field arrangements, baseball, softball, um, uh, football, cricket, um, athletics. What we're doing in this precinct at the moment is the ICT building in the middle and the academy accommodation to the north. Oh, I might just go back a slide, sorry. That'll do. Um, oh, sorry, for some reason it keeps going forward. Like if I just go back to that. Um, the And then some surrounding kind of master planning works with the roads and um, some new sporting fields. So the ICT building, the intention of the building is um, for uh, pro athletes and sub-level athletes to use this facility for training and um, develop their um, professional skills. Uh, it's also a facility for international teams to come and visit. They stay at the academy accommodation and use the building for training again and the rest of the grounds. Um, and uh, as well as um, it has a, a, a high level of um, sports medicine facilities or sports medical facilities in it. And really the Blacktown intention was to um, bring in the community to use this building, be it um, for injury, for rehabilitation for people, um, for people who might have a disability and need to use the facilities here. Or, or general community to come here for other events and the building as a sort of backdrop to something else happening in the precinct. So the building has a lot of this sort of stuff in it. Um, and this was from a study tour that we did. Uh, a lot of kind of technical equipment, gyms, weight rooms, um, different sort of uh, equipments for analyzing and, um, uh, and testing people's performance as well as rehabilitation kind of pools, um, therapy pools, et cetera. But um, so it's got a lot of that in it. The, the other thing with the international examples that we looked at was that they're usually compounded buildings, particularly in the US. They don't have a sort of public face to them as such or any sort of public integration. 
<clears throat> they're usually surrounded by a car park and not very well sort of stitched into their context or their, their landscape. And it's usually sort of hard to tell what they actually are. They could be a sort of shed, anything from a shed to an office building. Um, so they're not, they don't have any sort of inviting um, or any sort of civic presence. So um, part of our brief was to look at that and how to combine um, the private aspects of this facility, this training facility and the public aspects and how to kind of combine them um, and make this building um, have a sort of civic presence. Um, one thing about Blacktown, which is uh, it has a very large ethnic and cultural di um, diversity uh, within its population, which um, uh, makes it sort of uh, unique in many ways. And uh, certainly Blacktown Council wanted us to sort of look at that as a means to look at the architecture and make this really, as I say, a building for everyone. And obviously that's a theme that is of great interest to us uh, in terms of architectural themes, uh, 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 cultural diversity. Um, and one sort of commonality that we can kind of pull out of these things is that they have uh, incredible kind of formal topologies. They are highly ornate. They often have sort of cultural emblems or iconic kind of forms within them. They're sort of spatial kind of aspects and um, also there and just sheer colour and, and also a sort of sense of the local material incorporated into it. And, and this is obviously reflected in a lot of our other work, um, particularly uh, buildings that aren't necessarily considered civic buildings like the one on the lower um, right hand side that, that is a private um, apartment building. But when, when we explore all those themes about colour and shape and form and cultural um, narratives, they present a very positive, very outward looking, very connected um, architectural project that is either connected with its local kind of um, landscape or, or the, the sort of broader um, area around it or the broader city around it. So um, these are all themes that we want to tie into our building. So from one sort of sort of cultural object to another, the shoe, um, like those sort of cultural monuments, they embody a lot of that sort of thinking as well. The idea of pat patination, um, cult be it from sort of cultural origins, um, form, material, um, aesthetics, uh, sort of uh, kind of styling all embodied in one thing. And they also incorporate a high specificity in terms of their function. Um, this idea of compression and movement. Um, so even when a shoe is not in um, being used, it looks like it's meant to be doing something or looks like it's in the process of doing something. It's, it's sort of dynamic and um, um, meant for a particular function. So to our building, um, we're trying to body some of those ideas, this, this idea of space and time and moving through space in a in a in a um, sporting way, obviously, uh, the ball, uh, a fairly simple kind of idea about that, um, repetitively moving through space, um, but frozen in time. Um, and we we've often sort of used these sort of processes, but the idea that this might be a means to somehow combine that kind of community public. Um, idea in the yellow that represented by the ball and passing through this sort of more harder, more pragmatic functional box um, that, it, that that's around it. And then if we speed up that object into a sort of super super string as it were um, in with lots of segments on it and subtract that from that volume, it becomes a sort of central community spine, um, to this um, bigger facility. 
And then back to the shoe, that deliberate outline of the kind of footprint or the idea of the literal architectural footprint, um, using that to define that functional box. And that um, if we look at all the textures and shapes there, that that outline houses a whole lot of specific kind of forms within it, all tied together by this um, functional dynamic um, central spine linking it all through. So this is just a sort of one of our earlier plans, um, diagrammatic plans, a cutaway plan of the building. We can see the um, front forecourt here to the street, uh, that dynamic ball moving through, creating the entry foyer, back outside, creating this um, northern forecourt, and then back into the building, creating a running track. And these spaces hang off that, um, the multi-purpose sports medicine aquatics, and they can be as engaged with that space um, or as shut off from that space as needs required. And the same with upstairs, which has office and um, auditorium um, spaces, they, that can engage with that um, central spine as well, or not. So just looking at the renders of the building, that obviously that clear sort of footprint shape, we deliberately moved it towards the, um, the road network um, in the master plan to again, create a bit of address and a bit of intensity to the road uh, and a bit of civic presence as you're entering um, the site. If we look around to the north of the building, you can see the sort of bullion um, cut that comes through there and creates that looping um, courtyard to the north and then back in. And then if we go down at ground level, this is the entry road heading north. We see um, the initial stages of that ball going through and cutting out that um, uh, entry in a, in a radical way. And that that way has a kind of back to those sort of um, cultural um, architectural um, ideas that we had before, that idea of that this um, these forms can create kind of thresholds from one space into another. And if we move closer to the building, the idea that the landscape is actually moving in with the building as well in a dynamic way, as well as canopies that um, allow drop off and people to move in undercover. The, uh, the, that ball in motion creates this sort of um, fins or um, uh, these sort of segments that run through the building and create a kind of sense of animation and urgency into moving through that building. And again, to some of those ideas that Mark's already talked about, this idea of the cell and just sheer um, pro propelling yourself through space. That bullion object or that sort of way of cutting through um, into that central landscape area allows us to not only create a sort of entry opening on one side, a grand entry opening, a civic opening, it also creates sort of verandas and other types of lower spaces, protected spaces um, that are adjunct um, the, the landscape area. And you could see it going back into the building and creating the running track uh, in the middle of the screen there. And if I look back the other way, the way it cuts through that foyer and the continuation of that um, um, sort of aesthetic or, or, or technique and how it sort of blurs outside and inside um, together. The rest of the building is highly textured as well. It kind of is uh, notionally like these um, sort of monuments or, or the ability to sort of have a, a degree of aggregation or texturing or kind of cultural significance in, a, in its own right. And again, it sort of replicates some of those themes about sports padding and, and shoes um, as well. 
but it also has this sort of it integrates things like windows and balconies um, and the sort of cafe this idea that that surface is stretched over something and has this sort of permeability and um, and and breathes the way that the landscape sort of seems to spill out of this sort of opening um, and integrates everything together the idea that this is a sort of continual running track and that the landscape is part of the um, performance and workout session of the building um, from inside to out. It's another view of that. And it has this sort of um, switching, uh, as I mentioned before, inside and outside, this switching between figure ground and not not really being sure where 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 the program stops. Essentially, um, it 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 is about continuing continuing all this sort of public amenity um, back into the building and vice versa. And then back around a bit lower there, that surface there um, is a GRC um, panel, which is uh, repetitive. Um, but again, back to that, the idea of form and um, creation of those sort of shoe soles and even other things like um, these sort of sculptures or structures that the, there's technology there that can help us um, make those things rather than a sort of, or a type of digital craft probably. And um, that's something that's been of interest to uh, a lot of our projects in the past. Um, this is RMIT um, in, in Melbourne and the creation of those um, 3D panels up on top. And then there are other elements on the building. Um, this is the pop-up for the multi-purpose room, which has a, a kind of height uh, internal height of about eight metres. Uh, the top of it's probably about 10. Um, the rest of the building sort of sits at about six metres. But actually turning that into something that looks like it's resting on top, like it's a big turbine or a big kind of engine that is actually driving what's underneath it. And again, a sort of sense of dynamism um, that uh, is... Uh, perhaps what's happening inside. And then the running track, which spills out of the building at the other end, um, this sort of idea that you're passing from one space through to another and, and appearing out the other side, um, perhaps I need to go back into it. Um, so back to the overview of the project. I mean, this this is an ongoing project. We're we're sort of at fairly early stages of um, schematic design, um, and I'm, I'm working with Mark on this one and the rest of the Sydney team. And you know, they're looking for construction next year. So um, hopefully, it'll be a good one. Um, Mark, I might give back to you. I'm going to hand I'm going to hand over. over. Okay, okay. Let me see if this is working. Um, I don't know that I have control, Mark. Ah, there we go. Excellent. Um, well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Andrew. Um, so I'll uh, be talking about the work uh, that we're doing on, on this little building in Sydney. Um, reasonably well-known building. I think you might have <laughs> seen it before, the Sydney Opera House. We were very fortunate um, in 2015 to be appointed the architect for the Concert Hall Renewal Works. Um, what that means is we're primarily doing our works on the western side of the building, as shown on that slide uh, there. And really, um, what could be more appropriate, I guess, about talking about the Opera House with a sort of theme running through this lecture of sort of stranger than fiction? Clearly, uh, many of this audience will, will know its, uh, let's say, rich 
history, uh, obviously controversial at times. Um, in terms of the cast of characters, obviously Jorn Utzen, uh, very well known as the competition competition winning Danish designer uh, and the uh, the real sort of uh, the architect behind uh, the building that we see today. He um, he was prepared, um, I guess, for works or, or realised that that works may need, be needed to be done uh, to the building in in future times. The the opera house engaged him back uh, in the early 2000s, uh, or tried to re-engage him back with the building, and he was uh, engaged to author the what was called the Ulsan Design Principles, and they were a series of overarching kind of idealistic principles on how. Uh, the building could be approached if someone was to need to work on it in the future. It kind of outlined his overall vision, the key principles behind his design. And this quote that's on the screen was quite uh, sort of prescient, I guess, in that it, it, it did highlight the fact or, or recognise that the building will need to be changed. Um, and one important aspect of that is that when techno technology advances, there may be real reasons why the building needs to be uh, sort of renovated. A lesser known uh, cast of character, member of the sort of cast of characters, perhaps not to this audience, but certainly to the wider public, is uh, the work of Peter Hall. Um, when Nelson resigned in 66, Peter Hall was engaged to um, complete the building under the, the auspices of Hall, Todd and Littlemore. At what was an incredibly sort of tender age of 34, um, very young to sort of be faced with the daunting challenge of, of trying to finish this building. And really the works that we're doing on the building are very much engaging with and directly with the work of, uh, of Peter Hall, uh, more so even than perhaps uh, the work of Woodson. So what I'll be talking about primarily tonight uh, is the concert hall itself, um, and everything we see in that image of the concert hall there is is very much the work of, of Peter Hall and, and not necessarily Jorn Utzon. So how do you approach a task uh, like working uh, on the Opera House? Well, with a certain amount of, I guess, reverence and, and fear. Um, a quote we have sort of thrown out there in the past is that working on the Opera House is a little like doing uh, plastic surgery on the Queen. Now, I'm not here to start rumours that the Queen has had a lot of work done, of course, but, um, you know, if one was to, uh, you know, try and change a recognisable face like this, you would do it very carefully. But um, at a point, of course, you realise that, well, you just need to uh, get on with the job and approach it with, uh, you know, the due diligence and try and solve the problems that, uh, you know, the, the brief that we've been tasked with calls for. Obviously, we're not working in a vacuum. There are a number of um, sort of documents and design uh, umbrellas that our work comes under. The building itself is World Heritage listed. Um, there are the aforementioned Utsun design principles from 2002, um, and a conservation management plan drawn up for the building by a uh, well-known sort of heritage architect, Alan Croker in Sydney, who is part of our team, and we, we liaise with um, very closely as we work through the project. Um, but what we also unearthed as uh, part of our research into the project is, uh, or are a couple of these key texts on the work of Peter Hall, uh, both by uh, Dr. Anne Watson, um, particularly the book in the middle there, The Poison Chalice, which was a result of her doctorate thesis uh, on the work of Peter Hall. It's a fantastic text, and I would encourage any of you to sort of uh, seek it out and, uh, and give it a read, because, I mean, it really does unearth the uh, enormity of the task uh, that Peter Hall faced uh, as a young architect taking over the completion of the Opera House and delves very much into how he tackled the problems uh, that uh, Utzon had left, I guess, when he did resign and how he uh, went about trying to solve them. So our work uh, on the project can be broken down into sort of three key areas, uh, acoustics, functionality and accessibility. Tonight I'll be mainly just focusing on acoustics, I'm conscious of time, obviously, so I'll move through ours relatively quickly. We are doing a number of functional upgrades. We're renewing um, a lot of the theatre machinery above the ceiling. We're doing works to the stage and some of the key backstage spaces. And another key aspect of the work we're doing is the accessibility works. Um, at the moment, if you are mobility impaired at all, it's almost impossible to get to the northern foyer of the Opera House, which I'm sure many of you have been to. That space, it's one of the grandest spaces there, but very hard to get to. 
but given uh, the time that I have tonight, I'll just focus really quickly on the uh, the acoustics and the acoustic works we're doing uh, inside the concert hall itself. These comprise of three main uh, aspects. Uh, we're trying to improve uh, reflection within the hall. We've got some new surfaces which will improve acoustic diffusion, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, and also uh, looking at how contemporary music is handled within the hall, uh, and that's by needing uh, more acoustic absorption. So the hall itself opened in 72, and I think, you know, sort of almost immediately was sort of besieged with a reputation of not being ideal from an acoustic standpoint. Obviously, aesthetically, everyone raved about the building and it's uh, heralded around the world to this day, but it, it doesn't really live on any high lists of uh, key acoustic spaces uh, that orchestras are sort of dying to get into. Um, and some of the shortcomings that, you know, we've, I guess, delved into as part of our works uh, are really around the geometry of the building. So on the left there is a sort of outline plan uh, of the concert hall. It shows that it's a, a vineyard model with seating all around uh, the stage. And on the right is a section. And this next slide shows or sort of highlights two of the key issues that the room itself sort of faces. One is it's incredibly long. It's 43 metres from the front of the stage to the very back wall of the hall. And then it's also incredibly tall over the stage. It's about 23 metres from the stage to the upper reaches of the ceiling. We uh, did a study tour as well and did a number of comparisons as part of our research for the project. Um, this is comparing it with the recent Nouvelle uh, Philharmonie in Paris. Uh, again, on the top left, there is a comparative plan with the concert hall dotted uh, over the footprint of the Paris plan and similarly in section on the top right. And what you can clearly see there is the concert hall's considerably longer. The entire upper circle sort of sits outside the envelope of Nouvelle's hall. And the Nouvelle, Nouvelle Hall also has this sort of prominent overstage reflector that really brings down the height uh, over the stage. I mean, I would imagine most of you uh, watching this would perhaps know that, uh, you know, when an orchestra is playing on stage, they're doing so unamplified. You know, the, what you are hearing is, is literally the sound of uh, the musicians themselves without any acoustic reinforcement. Um, and what these shots show is the uh, existing reflector array that sits that's that sat over the stage for sort of some 40 odd years, you know, affectionately known as the clouds or the the donuts. They were really sort of ineffective in terms of um, the amount of coverage that they provided over the stage. Um, and what that meant was that a lot of the acoustic energy uh, from the orchestra was just getting lost up in that high volume uh, of the ceiling and, and similarly with the length of the hall, the acoustic energy wouldn't get back to the uh, to the far reaches of the hall. So what, what are we doing? Well, this plan shows a number of new acoustic elements that we're putting into the space. There's a new array of petal shaped uh, acoustic reflectors that sit over the stage there, coloured in purple, pink and green. They perform various different roles. Um, some of them are pushing uh, the sound energy out into the audience. Uh, the pink ones over the stage are providing immediate reflections for the musicians themselves. And the green ones are providing reflections uh, to the choir when the choir are in session. And then along the side walls, we have these one reflectors in light blue that um, are designed then to, to enhance reflection for uh, the audience members themselves. We've been working with, oh, it looks like the titles have gone a bit funny there, but we've been working with uh, some fantastic acoustic engineers from Germany, Muller BBM. These are some diagrams from their computer model and simulations showing how, the, or showing, I guess, the efficacy of some of these uh, reflectors and proving concept uh, digitally. This is a design render uh, then from very back of the hall showing these new acoustic uh, elements, the, the new acoustic reflectors over the stage. And then if you look to the side walls, you can see the new uh, drop down acoustic reflectors from uh, the white birch ceiling. In terms of color, um, ARM as Mark and Andrew have both shown in the previous projects, you know, we, we love uh, working with color Coming to the, this venue itself, we were um, presented with a very rich uh, magenta, uh, which is on the seat fabric. 
And we discovered this um, fantastic quote from Peter Hall from 1972, which he gave to the Sydney Morning Herald, which, I mean, you can read it there, but uh, was, was effectively stating that people are, are much more capable of uh, dealing with stronger assaults on the senses than they used to be. You've only got to hear the new pop music. Nobody's going to walk through muted grey interiors here, which we thought was just a lovely quote that sort of very much was of its time, but um, was something that we could also latch on to in terms of how we approached putting some of these new elements in the building. So another design render there, which shows how we're, uh, we're, we're depicting these uh, new acoustic reflectors in what is the sort of seat, uh, seat color magenta. They're going to be painted in automotive paint. Um, and what we hope very much is that you know, whilst they're clearly a new element in the space, and I think, you know, anyone will be able to tell that they're a new element in the space, but they do sit within the existing family of, of elements that are there and hopefully sit harmoniously and complement uh, the sort of grandeur of the space. And then another shot uh, there from one of the boxes. Given we started uh, back in 2015, we've had uh, quite a journey that's allowed us to do uh, on-site full-scale sort of prototypes. So this is a shot from 2016 where we managed to fully test uh, at one-to-one -one scale, obviously all the reflectors uh, over the stage. And that was fantastic because again, uh, you know, the orchestra, the SSO were able to play uh, with them. And there was this great quote from Catherine Hugel, who's the principal cello of the SSO, who, who clearly said, you know, for the first time in 27 years, she can hear what is going on in other parts of the orchestra. So. It's, it's been you know, a wonderful part of the journey to get this sort of proof of concept and, and hopefully assurance that uh, you know, it's going to be all right on the night when uh, the hall reopens. Um, this is a shot from one of our models showing the side wall uh, reflectors. The concert hall in the opera house itself is very much like it should be of a venue like uh, like that in that it's very much a, almost like a, a stage set where you've got this, the beautiful white shells on the outside and this incredibly uh, elaborate plywood ceiling uh, on the interior. But what lies behind is a, uh, a sort of cacophony of existing structure and 40 years of um, mechanical and uh, electrical servicing, which you know, is, is certainly proving to be one of the largest challenges that we face uh, as we tackle this project from a sort of coordination and, uh, you know, technical standpoint. This is a shot of how those side wall reflectors uh, work. They kind of slide down from the wall, uh, meaning that when they're shut, you know, you will read the wall as Peter Hall originally designed, a sort of fantastic design by done in conjunction with our theatre plan, uh, theatre consultants theatre plan from the UK, and a sort of close-up design render uh, of those. And then probably the other most visual uh, element that we're introducing into the hall are some uh, acoustic diffusion panelling. Um, what this slide shows on the left is Peter Hall's original Chevron uh, box fronts. Um, which were replaced in 2011 by some work done by uh, Lawrence Kierkegaard, which you know replaced them with flat uh, brush box panels, which uh, to us certainly read uh, you know as a sort of weaker architectural element. I guess they sort of took away some of the richness of what uh, Peter Hall had already had. So when we were tasked with the uh, you know the idea of looking at these surfaces we sort of tossed around many ideas in terms of how we would approach this, but the one we sort of settled on was, well, what does sound actually look like? And so that led us to uh, an idea of looking at uh, the sort of concept of cymatics, which is literally the visual sort of representation of sound and the, the patterns that sound makes. Um, and that led us to uh, hopefully an animation that will play now. And hopefully you are all seeing and hearing this. Um, if you're not hearing it, well, it probably doesn't matter. But the thing to look at is the walls around the stage uh, and the box fronts, uh, you'll see them sort of vibrating uh, with music that is being played on the stage. And, and, and what we used uh, was, was music itself to, uh, to help us design these surfaces. 
So this animation will show that flash there that we've taken a snapshot at a particular point of time and capturing a sort of frozen sense of music in these walls by a carved uh, timber panelling, uh, which does two things. Obviously, provides a new uh, sort of aesthetic element into the hall, but also tackles the problem of providing an acoustically diffused surface. Um, so that is replacing these sort of fairly bland um, brush box timber surfaces with these new carved and sculpted surfaces. We're doing that to uh, the entire sort of lower bowl shown in purple there and also to the rear of uh, many of the panels of the hall shown in red there. The stage surround itself shown there in a the design render and you can see at the backs of the walls there these will have these new diffusion panels as well. Again, given the time that we've had on the project, we've been able to prototype these things. These are some shots of a one by one metre sample of two types of the acoustic diffusion. They're sort of beautifully um, tactile objects that sort of you just can't resist kind of touching when you see them. And at the end of last year, we were able to install one full box front uh, into the hall, which stayed there until the hall closed uh, at the start of this year. And um, you know, it was wonderful to see it in the hall and have feedback from patrons and uh, sort of users of the hall. Um, and we, you know, it's certainly one of the elements that we're very excited about uh, seeing once uh, the project is realised. The other aspect of the hall, though, is um, you know it, it deals with a, a very, very strong and rigorous program of contemporary music. So everything I've been talking about so far has really dealt with how the orchestra in the hall is catered for. But, you know, as well as the orchestra, you'll get the Wu-Tang Clan who were there uh, late last year and their needs are very different to the SSOs. You know, when it's amplified music, you need to tamp down some of that acoustic. So you need to in introduce a whole uh, sort of range of absorptive cloth, etc. They do that in a very ad hoc kind of manner at the moment, uh, very labour intensive. Uh, and not a very sort of architectural approach to it. It's, uh, it's really just purely pragmatic and uh, very time consuming. We're looking to bring uh, certainly an architectural quality to that. This is a design render showing uh, a whole variety of new uh, acoustic drapery that can be brought into the hall. Uh, they drop down from the ceiling, they come out of the walls, uh, but the idea being that when they are retracted at literally the press of a button, the hall sort of returns to its original uh, geometry. And that's a shot showing a ceiling plan, showing how these integrate into uh, the existing crown geometry above the stage. And a shot closer to the stage. And then obviously when, once it's in sort of performance mode, the idea being that this all then sort of drops away and forms a backdrop uh, where the focus is then on the performance on stage. So that's just a quick hit uh, really on where uh, our work is at. We're very excited that the work is, uh, you know, just started construction now. And I guess, you know, we're kind of honoured to be adding our chapter to the uh, that sort of cast of characters that I introduced you to uh, at the start of the work. I'll hand back now to Mark and I think Adam. Nice. That was um, it was fantastic, guys. Really enjoyed. You got we got hammered by the um, seven o'clock closing of the um, the YouTube. So we went from two hundred and eighty watches to twenty eight, but we came back up to two hundred and twenty. So uh, the Opera House right. put them back in. So well done, Andrew. <laughs> um, given the time, I'm not going to ask many questions. There was a few questions. Um, about uh, artificial intelligence, um, but actually from the feed that I'm reading, actually there are also people who know people in your office that are having conversations about art artificial intelligence in your office as we speak. But I was going to ask a question. Um, ARM obviously is a very high design practice, like it's, it's a design-driven um, practice. And there's very few of those, I would say, that survive a single generation, and yet here we are, generation two, coming through at ARM, and I just, I'm interested in how, I'm interested in how you've been managing that, and, managing that and, uh, 
so that's always going funny, but that's all right. And how and what what is the new what are you as the new generation bringing to the practice? What is the kind of ambition of the practice? Is it about one of custodianship, or is the or will ARM die with the ARM? Um, I, I might start off with answering that question. Um, I, I I think it, there's a degree of, of custodianship here. Um, there's a there's a large group of people in the office who have been the very um, been there for you know twenty odd years. So there's a there's a group of senior architects who have been working together for quite a long time, and uh, you know we're we're um, very familiar with the sort of um, the line of thinking and the line of interrogation um, that we've done on the projects. Um, so they bring a lot of experience through um, it, it, um, all the new work um, that you know, and the same line of interrogation that we might have had, you know, some 10, 20 years ago. Um, but also, um, it, it's always been about this sort of line of um, questioning in the office about architecture and culture and um, other things that influence architecture and the city. Um, and I, I think there's a there's a continuation of that, um, certainly within the office and people running these projects. And even though times are changing and the, there's obviously different issues now, that same sort of line of questioning about what architecture can do or be or how it can respond to that, um, we're very much kind of continuing that. Good answer. Fantastic answer. The idea of custodianship. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, I think that we'll probably leave it there, but I wanted to thank you. I think I'm, I am now even more in love with my mongrel rapture now that I've seen how it's been produced and uh, the fact I can download the construction drawings for <laughs> Story Hall. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Got to go home and do it. I think every student needs to go out and buy it. Um, as I said, we've got copies of Mangle Rupture and we're going to be getting ARM to sign them. So anyone who wants a signed copy, give us a, drop us an email. Um, but we wanted to thank you guys. We really appreciate the time and effort you put into putting this presentation. A really it's an excellent selection of projects for us to have a look at and um, discuss. So I do want to thank you a lot for that. It's really impressive. Uh, and just to remind everybody that this Thursday night we have Ian Moore from uh, Ian Moore Architects uh, coming to have a chat to us from Sydney. Um, so tune in, jump on Eventbrite. It's the easiest way for me to get you the link to the YouTube event. Uh, so again, thanks to the team at RM, uh, Mark, Andrew and Andrew, really appreciate it. Um, and we'll see you all. Thank you, Adam. Pleasure, pleasure. We'll yeah. see you all next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you, guys.